Amen. Come on, give God some praise. Amen. Praise the Lord. Keep on praising Him. Hallelujah. What? Anyhow. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to call our attention back to the book of Psalms 138. The book of Psalms 138. Hey. Amen. No sister David, don't say it. Amen. The 138th book of Psalms. May we pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you praise. Hallelujah. Anyhow. Through our days, Lord, some of us are dealing with serious issues that can disrupt our praise to thee and the fact that you're with us. Sometimes, eternal Father, we can have the kind of trials and tribulations that can be so heavy on our hearts and our minds that sometimes we can't see you and we forget about you. We forget about praising. We forget about prayer. We forget even about calling on your name. We're praying, uh, Lord, that you will bless us with the hearing of your word. That, Lord, we'll be drawn closer to thee and less of this old world. Lord, I'm praying and we're praying now that you will use me and use us in this word-sharing moment. In the name of Jesus, we pray and give thanks that the church say, Amen. Amen. If you look with me at the 138th book of Psalms, we find the following for our hearing. I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. In the day when I cry, thou answerest me, thank you, Lord, and strengthenest me, and strength with strength in my soul. For a thought this hour may be used when you call on the Lord. When you call on the Lord. As slaves, it was common thought of the master that the African was ignorant when it came to worshiping one God. It is important that we realize that our ancestors did not serve multiple gods, but they did in fact believe in one God. What the slave master, and sometimes we did not realize, the African did believe in monotheism. If you'll say that with me, monotheism. monotheism. Let's say it again, monotheism. monotheism. Monotheism is the belief in one God, while polytheism believed in more than one God. And our ancestors embraced an understanding of what is known as ancestors as intermediaries. I mean, if you went and saw the movie The Black Panther, if you notice the brother that played the role of the Black Panther, there were times when he would go through serious issues. And then all of a sudden, we would see him in this faraway land of tranquility with clouds and very peaceful place. And all of a sudden, his father would show him. He would visit his father when he wanted to see clarity and wisdom and confirmation about issues that were going on in their lives. And a lot of times when the masters and others saw the Africans calling on their elders and calling on those that had died, they confused it with as if they were calling on more than one God when they really believed that the ancestors that believed in God and when they died and went to heaven, they were closer to God in heaven than we were down on the earth. So they would talk to their mothers and fathers to get clarity about what's going on in heaven. In our day and time, we... We worship inside of nice facilities with carpet on the floor and 
air and heating units and elaborate sound systems and lighting. We have plush seats and all the basic comforts that anybody would want to have when they go inside of a church. But we must be reminded that our four parents had no temple. They had no churches and no physical houses of worship. In a book by Wyatt T. Walker entitled Somebody's Calling My Name, Black Sacred Music and Social Change, he said even before the erection of physical places of worship, we had invisible churches, like we had an invisible railroad, an underground railroad, we had invisible churches and southern plantations that gave cohesion and commonality to an oppressed people who had been snatched from their homeland and raped up their culture and languages. And these gatherings were often contrary to the pleasure of the slave masters and slave owners, and they didn't like the idea of these non-fixed sites of meeting places where the slaves would gather and worship the Lord. So where was the slave to worship? after working in the field all week long. Late in the evening, they would sneak down to a swamp or the forest to what is known as bush, to bush harbors and worship and praise God in the open late at night and at times when others would not be around. These invisible churches like the Underground Railroad were all that they had to freely express themselves to the Lord. And they prayed, and they prayed, and they, they sung, and they sung, and they prayed God out in the middle of nowhere sometimes, and they preached, and they preached, and they called upon the Lord. And do you know what a part of their praying and calling on the Lord was about? They were calling and talking to the Lord about their children, and children's children would have a better day. Look at us now. The day has come. We have the education, and it may not be all that we need at times because we're still fighting for things to be equal and to be better. We, we do have better housing and we have careers, but guess what? The prayers of our ancestors have been answered. But the freedom, yeah, that was a moment of praise, but the freedom to worship going to church just seems to so many to now no longer be important. To us, church is about convenience and about comfort. But this is not what it was for our ancestors four and five and six generations ago. I believe sometimes that God looks down on us and pulls out his own playlist of music. And I can hear the sounds of B.B. King. He looks down at his creation and shakes his head sometimes and says, the thrill is gone. The thrill is gone away. The thrill is gone, baby. The thrill is gone away. You know, and God said, you know you didn't done me wrong. And you'll be sorry someday. I believe that we can go turn this around. That when you come to church, that you can think of the ancestors that didn't have a church. I believe we can turn it around that you don't have to be as down or depressed when you think about your grandmama and your great grandmama and your great great grandmama and what they went through in order that we can have a better day. But oh, when you call upon the Lord, it'll make a difference in your life. And they knew something about calling on the Lord. When we look at the psalmist and he tells us in verse 1 that I praise thee, thank you, Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. After all the experiences in David's life, he was clear that his praise belonged, yes he was, to the Lord. We denote that his level of convictions in the Lord, when you read all of these verses, he said, I will praise. He said, I will sing. I will worship. And then he says, I will cry to the Lord. The use of I was not an arrogant tone, but one of selfish submission evidencing his commitment to the sovereign and supreme God. The only time some of us will praise God is when we come on church, if we come to church, that we might praise him even when we're inside of church. But, but this is not the only place that you ought to be praising God. David's commitment is made known when he said, you see it right there, he said, his whole heart. 
not hands, not part, not portion, not some, but his whole heart. Your best worship will always be with your whole heart. We've heard the psalmist say in the psalmist, Psalms 103, verse 1. He said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Yes. A mother made soup and sandwiches for her child, and she gave him half of the bologna sandwich, and then a bowl of chicken soup. She put the other half of the sandwich in the refrigerator, and he was watching her the whole time, and when she left the kitchen, he got up from the table and went in the icebox and ate the other half of the sandwich. And later on in the day, she went back to the refrigerator and saw where he had ate the whole thing. And we need to realize that God is not looking for half of the sandwich. God is looking for the whole thing. He knows that sometimes that you're tired and may not feel like crazy. He knows that sometimes that you want to watch that show during the week. He knows that sometimes you got to catch the game. And he knows sometimes you have things that you want to do and things that you like to do. But God wants his time to him. God doesn't want part of you. He wants all of you. He knows that there are things that are on your mind and things that are in your heart. He knows that you're going through things. But oh, when you learn how to pray the Lord with all of your heart. Not, not just on Sunday, but even learning how to strike up a song during the week. Or just pray. Sometimes you just need to praise God, not when you get out of it. Sometimes we make the Father saying, I'm going to tell God thank you when I get out of it. I'm sure enough going to give God praise when I get out of it. No, no, you, you got to know how to praise God when you're going through. You got to know how to thank Him before you get out of it. I was sit daily. It's speaking about praising God also when other gods exist. Before these other idols and gods and spirits. He's not ashamed to give God praise and his mind is all made up. Over centuries the Hebrews have been enslaved and exposed and introduced to Babylonian culture. And many other people adopted pagan rituals and false gods. And the prophet Isaiah addressed Israel by saying that these gods that y'all have created, they have no power. He told him Isaiah 46 and 7, he said that the people are carrying these gods around on their shoulders and they set them down in certain places and all the, the idol does is just sit there and stand there and they can't talk to the idol and the idol cannot move. They, they cry to the idol and the idol cannot answer nor save them out of their troubles and many of us have idols and things in our lives that we have placed in our lives so that we can have confidence. Whatever it is that you rely on cannot do nothing for you. David knew that of all his trials that no idol God had what it took to help him in the time of his troubles and in the time of his, his temptation. He knew that there was only one God that he could cry out to and some of us have false gods that we depend on to save us and some of us or idol worship, and when we put more trust in money than we do in the Lord Jesus, when we put more trust in people than we do in the Lord Jesus, when we put more trust in technology than we do in the Lord Jesus, many of us are worshiping God and don't even realize it, rather than giving God all the praise. We look at verse 2, it says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness. And for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy words above all thy name. David's convictions about worshiping God is known in the tradition of worshiping toward God's holy temple. The temple was a specified and designated house of worship that suggests that God could not be approached without full reverence and respect. When David said worship toward it is not the same as worshiping inside of the temple. Because in those times, not everyone and anyone was allowed to enter the church when they got ready because you really had to come to church with your mind focused upon the Lord about what it meant to be holy and what it meant to be sacred and what it meant to be in a unique place to come and worship the presence of the Lord. I read in the book of Kings, 1 Kings 8 and 29, where it says, 
that thy eyes may be open toward his house. Thank you, Lord, night and day. Even toward the place of which thou hast said my name. He said, my name shall be there. That thou mayest hearken unto the prayers which thy servant have made toward this place. The place that God designated as his house is not to be worshipped. But the one in whom the house represents is worthy of all the worship. There are many statistics and articles and conversations that church attendance and membership is in decline. There are people that are looking for worship that is more about them being comfortable and more about them having the conveniences of their life. Many people are going to church and to worship because they want to have their personal appetite filled and their personal taste being fulfilled. There are young people that are out, in, out of worship for techno versions of experiencing God. But we want to strongly suggest this hour that, that God's house, visible and invisible, is necessary for the body of Jesus Christ. You know, all houses have their purpose, but God's house is all about God. It's not about you and it's not about me. And there are many people that are trying to say everything about God around their timetable and around their schedule and when they get ready and now of what they want instead of what God wants. But when, when we come to church and worship, it's really not about you. When we come to church and worship, it's not even about me. When we come to church and worship, we come because we believe that God is a good God. We come to worship because God is a righteous God. He knows that there are things that are going on in your life. But oh, can you learn how to worship him in spirit and in truth? He shows you how to rise above your circumstances. He shows how to go through the things that you're dealing with. And you don't understand how you got into it in the first place. But you got to worship him. You got to worship him. Now there are those that believe that there's no reason to even praise the Lord. God has not done that. Or God has not done enough. But David reminds us that to praise his name for his loving kindness and for his truth. David had experienced the goodness of God. He had done a lot of right things in his life. But then he also had did many sins in his life. The kind of sins that deserved the death penalty. You know, he committed adultery against Bathsheba and he should have been stoned to death. He plotted and murdered against Uriah, her husband, and his life should have been taken right then. But in time, he realized that he was wrong, and, and he said he said nothing to Nathan, the prophet, who came to him and told him, you know, David, you're wrong for everything you did. So when we go to the 51st book of Psalms, we really find David confessing about the things that he was doing in his life. He didn't try to dismiss what he had done in his life. He didn't try to excuse the sin that he had done in his life. But in the 51st book of Psalm, he, he turned to God and said, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, O oh God, according to thy, thy loving kindness, according to thy multitude of the tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. What David found out is that God does not want you to live wrong. God does not want you to live in sin. God does not want you to have a messed up life, a tore up life. And then he realizes that God not only not wants you to have a sinful life, but he wants you to have a life where, where you realize God's ongoing love. He wants you to realize God's ongoing mercy for you. He wants you to realize God's ongoing grace. See, no one can excuse the fact. Everyone in here has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Is that right? Then we must admit that like David, we should have died in whatever our sins were. Some of us should have caught some diseases. Some of us should have been abused even more. Some of us should have lost our jobs. And every time in the mix, God has loving kindness for us. And he shows us his mercy time and time again. If you really take a clear look at the picture, and even the things that you're going through right now, every time we turn around, God is exposing us to his love. Every time we turn around, God is exposing us to his grace. Every time we turn around, God is exposing us to his mercy. 
And some of us are saying right now, well, Pastor, I don't see his love. Pastor, I don't see the grace. Pastor, I don't see the mercy. But the fact that you came to church this morning, the fact that you came to church under your own strength, is just enough to talk about the loving kindness of the Lord. You should not have made it today. You should not have made it through last week. The situation should have taken you out. The situation should have drawn you away. The situation should have buried you in your stuff. It should have locked you away. It should have thrown you away. But the fact that you're here this morning is enough to give God praise. The fact that you got up this morning is enough reason to give God the praise. Verse 3 tells us, In that day, thank you, Lord, when I cry, thy answers me and strengthenest me with strength in my soul. David said, when he cried to God, God answered him. Yes, he did. And there are times when you may need to call on God until he answers. Sometimes we call one time and we didn't hear from the Lord and we give up. But you got to know how to keep on calling on God. He may not answer when, when you want him to answer. But he'll answer. It's been said that sometimes God will say yes. Sometimes God will say no. Sometimes God might say maybe. And sometimes God will say maybe not right now. But God does answer when, when he answers. And however he answers, it's still a way of God giving us strength. Giving us strength for our soul. Someone may be saying that I need this strength, but sometimes it looks like I don't have it. But I always will go back to Isaiah when I need added strength. And, and I hear the word say, Has I not known? Has I not heard? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he fainted not. No, 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 God is not dead. God is not weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giving power to the faint. Yeah. And to them that have no, no might, he increases their strength. Yeah. Even young folk will faint and be weary. And the young men and young women shall utterly fall. But oh, they that wait upon the Lord. You got to know how to wait on the Lord. The Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and they shall not faint. Oh, when our great grandparents came across the Atlantic Ocean on ships and shackles on their feet and handcuffs on their hands, iron collars around their necks, and they had nobody to call on but the Lord. In the field, they had nobody to call on but the Lord. In the big house, they had nobody to call on but the Lord. On the auction blocks, they had nobody to call on but the Lord. In their time like them, when you have nobody to call on but the Lord. The council is not there because there is no appointment. The doctor is not there without any kind of appointment. And there are times when your pastor can't help you. And there are times when your best friend can't help you. And there are times when your mama can't help you. And times when your daddy can't help you. And times when you can't even help yourself. All you need to know is that you can't call on the Lord. Oh, when you call on him, he'll answer. When you call on him, he'll give you strength. That he had to cry. That he had to call out to the Lord. Think about it, brothers and sisters. David was a king. He was not just anybody. He had position. He had power. And he had authority. And he had enough sense that even though he had all the things around him, 
He still had to call on the Lord. David was resourceful, more so than any individual. In his day and time, and even this time, David had money. David was wealthy. David was even a fighter. He was a skilled soldier. You remember, he took even a slingshot and took out a giant. He fought bears and, and wolves. He could speak a word as king, and his word would become a commandment, even as law. And yet, with all of his accomplishments and all the things that had gone wrong in his life, yeah. all that he was and all that he is and all that yeah. he hoped to be, David still took time to cry out to the Lord. There are times when you're going through things. There are times when you're suffering in different things in your life. And you need to know how to cry out to the Lord. When the Hebrews were slaves down in Egypt, the Lord said in Exodus 3 and 7, He said, I, I see your afflictions and, and I hear your cries because of the taskmasters that are in your life. He said, I not only see you and I not only hear you, but, but I know the sorrows that are going on in your life. The slaves were being worked so hard that they went into a state of affliction. And sometimes in your life, you too can enter a state of affliction. You can enter a state of affliction that leads to pure confusion. Confusion that leads to pure frustration. Frustration that leads to pure misery. Pure misery that leads to nothing but grief. Grief that leads to nothing but discouragement. Discouragement that leads to nothing but depression. Depression that leads to oppression. That ought to lead to confession about your repression. So you can have progress by crying out to the Lord. There are times in your life that you got to stand like Popeye the Sailor Man and say to the Lord, that's all I can stand and I can't stand no more. There are times when the pressure gets so heavy in your life. There are times when your last nerve has been stepped on. There are times when you've been backed up into the corner. He got up! 